So my title tonight is very straightforward, Game Over. And uh, that might be attention grabbing for some. Uh, one brother saw it and told me that this is probably a little bit of a shot to all the kids who've had their devices taken away from them over the last few weeks. Uh, but I did not mean that at all. It kind of slipped right by me. Uh, but if it kind of rubs it in a little bit, maybe you just needed that. And maybe it's uh, not kids eat free today, but kids eat a spoonful of gravel. But the, the title is Game Over. I don't know if you could tell it by the subtitle underneath this or just the tagline we included in this. Is It is Ending the Blame Game. And originally my title was The Blame Game, but I just rather, rather put it in this context, Game Over. Uh, putting it into the blame game. And in looking at that, I could say this maybe as a thesis statement. It's about taking responsibility, uh, taking responsibility for our actions, and just how much power is in taking responsibility. And there's a lot of things in our lives that are beyond our control. There's a lot of things that happen to us, and we're very quick to recognize I had nothing to do with this. But when we can take responsibility for ourselves and we can take responsibility for our families and our own decisions and our own conditions and even our own mistakes, it's very empowering. And it might not seem so, and I think it works against our human nature, but I want to look at taking responsibility because there's a power in doing that that breaks us out of a lot of mindsets that debilitate us and weaken us. And uh, kind of self-defeating is the phrase I believe I want to use, is there's a self-defeating mentality that we feel that we're doing ourselves a favor by blaming, but we're actually making it worse and bringing ourselves into a very negative cycle. So tonight, game over. The end to the blame game. Now, I'll just pick up right where we were in verse 9. As we've already seen that man was tempted, or the woman was tempted, participation uh, continues to the man. Adam and the woman have fallen. They've come up with their ways of addressing their fallen nature. And now comes the moment when they're going to answer to God. And he says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you? I guess we could have read verse 8, but we just skipped over that part where they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden and they were... Uh, and they hid themselves amongst the trees. If I, we read that, good. It says, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And now God says, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten? Adam points his finger at the woman, and then he says, What is this thou hast done? And the woman said, Adam points his finger at the woman, and then he says, What is this thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled. Yep, I did exactly what you asked him not to do, but his answer is, The woman that you gave me, she gave it to me, and I did to verbalize what's taking place. Adam says, I was afraid, and I hid. And it's like, well, what have you done? And the very first thing they do, and I want to look at it as one of the first characteristics of their broken nature, was to say, she did it. And then she's like, he did it, and points to the serpent. And we know that God, despite where the fingers were placed, in verse 14, he begins to curse the serpent, and there's judgment. But this was the act. Adam blamed the woman. The woman blamed the serpent. And to kind of get us, kind of grease the skids a little bit, get our minds thinking on what's been burdening me on this subject over the last few weeks, it's an act or expression of disapproval. That's what a noun, blame, would be an act of disapproval. Or it would be the responsibility for something that is wrong or done wrong. You accept the blame or you place blame. It's an act of expressing disapproval or kind of the responsibility for something that is wrong. We used it as a verb where Adam blamed the woman. It's placing responsibility on somebody for something that you deem wrong. If somebody bakes a really, really good cake, you don't blame them for it, right? So it kind of blame carries with it this negative connotation. Uh, Who's done this? And are you looking someone to blame? And when it's good, you're, you're looking to compliment. You're looking to express something. So blame kind of carries with it a wrong. Blame means if you blame someone, it means to find fault with them. And we'll, write, we'll kind of touch on what fault means here in a moment. Now, I, I share this, and I hope that this could strike you as adding some kind of layers or some depth to this, but to use the verb blame. If I blame you, it's a rebuke. The word means, and it's di- a richness and its original meaning in the, these other languages, it means to condemn or to criticize. And the very, if you want to say the etymology of the word or just the, the, the conjugation of it and what builds it and its prefixes and suffix, it's the suffix of it in the blame, it's the opposite of praise. It's something, just something that just struck me and I just meditated on for some time. It's a po- to blame is the opposite of praising someone. 
To blame is the opposite of commending someone. So if you just looked at it logically, that if something bad happens, you blame someone. If something good happens, you praise them or give them credit. And so blame kind of is the opposite of encouraging somebody. Blame does the opposite of inspiring somebody. And I want you to think about that, that that's what blame does is it does more to kind of tear down and more to harm someone just in its word because when you praise someone, that does something to encourage one. But when you blame, that's a discouragement. I think that's a good, important, very important and very good point to consider as we talk about the blame game. Now, in Romans, so as we've looked at the failure of the man and the woman in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, speaks this, and we're just kind of grabbing a truth from this. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is in the figure of him that was to come. So it's Adam's transgression. Adam sinned. Adam, uh, he, he made a mistake, and though we can kind of delineate where his mistake was and what he did and how he fell and what he was knowledgeable of and, and what his act was, if we could put it this way, Adam's transgression, the phrase suggests that he bore some responsibility. And so Adam was responsible despite his instinct to blame the woman. When God says, did you eat of the tree in the Garden of Eden or this, God, this tree that I told you not to eat of, Adam answering truthfully could have just simply said yes I did but rather he says uh, this woman that you gave me and, and notice how he's not even totally shifting the blame on the woman right this woman that I don't know if you forgot you gave me that, that's that's interesting Shift, he shifted wanting to shift the blame to the woman but in case there's any question whether or not Adam was responsible he's like now you you're the one that gave her to me like when, when, I was, when it was just this, we were doing fine. But when you wanted to put me to sleep and take her out, now that she stands there and she can be tempted, now I've fallen because you've done this, and it's a way of shifting the blame. And if I could say this, he had every reason just to own it. Every reason to say, yes, I did it. In verse 12, he could have just said, instead of saying, the woman that thou gavest to me, he could have said, yes, I did it. But instead, he shifts it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, it says, And Adam was not deceived, so it kind of gives some color to his action. Brother Branham in one place says she was a part of him, and he was willing to take her responsibility upon himself. So Adam had already acted in the responsible way. Brother Branham characterizing the act that Abraham did. It's so beautiful as Romans 5, 14 is pointing to it, that Adam, even in his sinning, was a figure of Christ who was to come, who would become our sin. So he could have taken responsibility, but it, what a beautiful picture he would have painted of how that Christ bore, took responsibility for our own sins. But yet he, when he verbalized it, Brother Bram said when he acted, he was taking responsibility for the woman. But now when answering for it, he shifts a little bit. But now it says Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Guess what? The Bible says Adam transgressed. The Bible says the woman was responsible as well. So neither one of them could we build the scriptural case to say that they had no reason to admit culpability or they just, they were, one of them was innocent, one of them had been duped uh, 100% completely and they shared no blame. But despite her instinct to pass the blame to the serpent, she was responsible. And she knew she was at fault, but she passed it on. And in each one of these instances, maybe we could ask, we're looking at this scene, the temptation and the fall. And before we get into the judgment, when there's judgment, if we looked at it from a legal perspective, they're trying to affix liability for one who has acted. In a civil context, they can actually say, you're 40% to blame, you're 60% to blame. And they can kind of divide liability. If injuries were a certain amount and you're proportionally liable, you can, they can reduce the amount you would owe according to what they felt you were responsible for and who's to blame. You may be speeding through a, a, a green light and somebody may run the red light and they could say, you know what, but for your speeding, you're partially liable. And the person who ran the red light, they're also liable. So when we look at the situation, we're saying, well, who's at fault? Fault is a shortcoming or a failure. Uh, the, the word even suggests some sort of opening or gap where something is left undone and, and there's a fault. Like you think of a fissure or a, a break in something. It's a flaw. It's a deficiency. There's some sort of lacking. So when we say fault... It's really broad that we could bring ourselves, uh, who's at fault? Who did something wrong? Who left something undone? Who did the shortcoming? Who failed? Uh, in these situations, who's to blame? 
Who would we blame in this? As Adam said, it's the woman that thou gavest me. Do we just kind of back all the way up and say, well, let's just go ahead and blame God? Or do we say, well, it was the devil who used the serpent? We're, we're looking at who's responsible for the act. Who, who should bear the consequences for what was done? And that's what we read in the preceding verses. And what we're, what we're describing is the blame game. And... It was sometime last year that I heard this phrase. I remember, Brother John, if you want to show that. Uh, I was going to use the all your base are belong to us for this. Uh, but it says, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying I'm blaming you. <laughs> I, it just really stuck with me. It, and this was the beginning of me thinking about blame and, the, and this, this sermon that we're preaching tonight that I believe we'll just be able to finish tonight, Lord willing, and it just stand on its own. And, and I feel that this is a very important subject that we're expressing to you tonight. And I would, I would encourage you to hit that subscribe button. No, I would encourage you to share this with anybody who misses it that's part of our church. Because there's a chance there's some that would not hear this. And I feel it's so important for us as a church to have this. To understand this principle and have this instinct. That, that when something goes wrong, we're not quick to point the finger like Adam. And when the finger gets pointed at us, we're not quick to keep it going. We're the kind of people that says, game over. What happened? Let's fix it. Right? And so I feel this is a very, very important subject. And it was this phrase, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying I'm blaming you. I think it just perfectly describes the mindset of people in the world today. And it kind of carries with it the human nature to where there's my, there might even be a part of us that says, I know it's not your fault, but I'm blaming you. I know it wasn't your mistake. I know it wasn't your deficiency. I, was, I know it wasn't you that left the opening. I know it's not you that had the lacking. You're not the one with the blemish, but yet I still need to blame somebody. And that to me is what makes it a game almost, is that there's, it, it has its own set of rules uh, uh, that's kind of confined to this activity. Is the, whole, the whole objective and goal is to not be the one that's to blame. So even if you're not at fault, you blame somebody else. Or even if you are, even if they're not at fault, you blame them. So if you want to have t-shirts printed, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying I'm blaming you. It would make for an interesting one. There's one a friend of mine told me one time. It was on the front. or I think it just said on the front, sometimes never, sometimes regardless. I chew on that for a while. Now, as we've looked at the very first blame game, I hope we've kind of introduced some things into our hearts tonight, our minds as we think about it. And fault and blame, if we're using blame or fault and kind of using those interchangeably, they really center on responsibility. And so, though it would say, I'm not saying it's your fault, I say that I'm blaming you. You know, in some ways what's happening is since blame and fault relate to someone's responsibility, to blame someone would be our effort to make someone accountable. So something happens, uh, the, the man eats uh, of the, in the analogy, eats of the tree, of the, this fruit of the tree, and now he's partaken in it. And now as he's been called in the carpet, did you do what I told you not to do? He, when he says, the woman that thou gavest to me, there, there's some sense in what he's doing. He's trying to say, you know what? She's the one that should answer for this. Because the question was asked of him. And by pointing the finger, he's trying, it's an effort to make the woman accountable. And so we blame or find fault when someone is irresponsible. And we do that because... In the most innocent sense, we want them to answer for it. And so now I feel like I'm real deep into the teaching part of this to we're trying to unpack this blame game and how it works. That when somebody does something, let's say that you're not even a participant. You're an observer. And you see that somebody does something and causes something. And you're like, oh my goodness, look what they've done. And someone says, what's happened here? You go, he did it. He did it. It's the very action of saying, well, he should, he should be responsible for that. He, he, should he should answer for what he's done. So it's our attempt to get them to answer for something they've done. Now, I, I, I may have lost count, and I don't know if I wrote it down here what it is. So if I get the numbers wrong, it's not an Easter egg. I apologize. I just got it wrong. And uh, it reminds me of a sermon Brother Paul LaFontaine preached one time where he called it three simple words, and he kept using four over and over and over again. <laughs> and it was just three simple words. Just remember these simple words, you know, and just... Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's kind of. <laughs> but I want to go through some problems. I think I maybe have six here. Just three simple problems. Six of them. And 
And the first problem I identify with the blame game, because now the instinct to blame someone is they need to answer for this. But you know what? People just instinctively resist accountability. It's just wired in us that whenever, and, and, we, and it's just really, really strong from a young age, that whenever someone's, did you, did, you know, a kid could be one and a half years old and learned its first words and has got a paintbrush in their hand, paint everywhere, paint all over the wall. It's like, did you do that? And they're like, and they point to the dog, right? It's just hardwired and it works really good from the beginning that we just instinctively resist accountability. Now, as we begin to become more adults or we are more adult-like, and not just there in a diaper with a paintbrush. Our pride gets in the way and we don't like to be questioned about something. When we've done something, we don't, like to, we don't want to have to answer for it. We don't like to be challenged. Why did you do this? And explain yourself. That's being answerable. We, by nature, resist that. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. Just watch how quickly this is kind of nature filters into the children. And the Lord said unto Cain after, uh, 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 regarding Abel, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And what was this? He resists the even the inference of responsibility. Like, where's your brother? And his first thing is, instead of maybe feeling that if he's being asked, do you even know where he is? He feels that he's responsible for his whereabouts. He says, am I my brother's keeper? The question doesn't even necessarily suggest that he knew or should have been responsible for, or that he was responsible for it. But it shows when he says, am I my brother's keeper? It shows that he's not willing to be accountable. He doesn't want to be questioned. He doesn't want to have to answer. And just as Adam showed it, I think we're all very good at blaming, but not very good at accepting responsibility. In Romans chapter 9, verse 19, it says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Paul, in talking about election, Paul talking about the sovereignty of God and how that he chooses and how he chooses by love. He anticipates the objection. And he just draws from human nature that's just going to say, Well, then why does God blame me? Why does he find fault with me? Why should we be held accountable? Isn't God to blame? Paul anticipates the objection, and remember, he doesn't even answer it because it's not even worth answering. But it shows the nature of humanity, not willing to accept responsibility, quick to shift the blame. Why does he yet blame us? Why does he find fault with us? Who's resisted his will? Is it he to blame for the way that we are? And so that's, this is the problem with the blame game, is we instinctively resist accountability. Or we, or we just, if I could put it this way, maybe the more obvious way, we just don't like to be blamed. We're good at blaming, but not very good at being blamed. And so if I could kind of uh, extend that a little bit and call it another problem. This is problem number two, if you're counting my words. Another problem with the blame game is it's an act of imposing accountability on another. Since we're trying to hold them accountable, if someone's done something and acted in a way to where they've caused a problem and we say, he did it, he did it, he has to answer by, that, by playing the blame game, you're not only wanting to hold someone accountable and they instinctively resist it, you're doing it against their will. Because the, it's an act of imposing answerability on someone. If we place the blame, it's the act of identifying someone that we think should, is responsible for a fault. Someone who's responsible for a wrong. And if the person's unwilling to be accountable, a blame usually only provokes a defense. So this is the problem with it. That unless they, unless they have, are willing to be held accountable, once you blame them, you're not going to get them to say, oh, sorry, I did it. It's usually, you gave me the woman. It was a serpent that did it. What, am I my brother's keeper? So if someone is not willing to make themselves accountable, it's only going to be an instinct to be, to, be, uh, to be defensive. I tell you, I don't know all the... Nijitsus and all the other things out there, the MMA uh, levels, but we've all got a black belt in self-defense, right? Because as soon as somebody, as soon as somebody, we just, we just sense it. <laughs> I didn't do that, right? Because our self-defenses are just so strong that we just instinctively, it's just a reflex. They, before they could even get out of the mouth, ah, no, uh, -uh I didn't do that, <laughs> right? And we take care of it real quick because nothing's going to touch us. And we're just really, really good at this instinctually 
not being held accountable. Because if we haven't asked for it, we feel that it's kind of being uh, pushed on us. I had a friend one time that says uh, it was unsolicited or uns, an unsolicited advice is criticism in another form. They just didn't want to be accountable. But there's a truth to it because that's how you're going to take it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There is a lot that can be said about accountability. I'm kind of carving this out just as a little part of the blame game. But when it says to submit ourselves to one another in the fear of God, the word submitting speaks of arranging ourselves, not necessarily underneath somebody, but it's arranging ourselves to one another. That if we submit ourselves one to another, you tell me who's submitting and who's not. If I've submitted to you and you've submitted to me, who do you say is the, who, who's the most powerful? Who's the one under subjection? We've submitted to each other. We've leveled it. So it's not so much trying to put someone on top and someone on bottom and someone in power and someone in a position of weakness. If we submit ourselves one to another, the phrase is suggesting that we're arranging ourselves to one another in relationship. And that it's a voluntary, the word submitting ourselves one to another, it means a voluntary attitude of cooperation. It is, it's a giving in. It's assuming responsibility, that I'm going to assume responsibility. I'm going to answer to you, and, I, and you're, I'm willing to answer to you. And it's this mutual accountability and this mutual dependency where we're going to mutually carry a burden. I'll answer for myself. You're answering for yourselves. Okay, let's submit ourselves one to another. And to submit one to another, it means to yield to one's admonition or advice. So it, it, in that way, you just take care of the fact that it's unsolicited advice. You say, I'm willing to hear. I'm willing to listen. That's what it means to submit one to another. To submit to someone, it means you're making yourself subject to answer to someone. And so if someone is not willing to submit to another person and you blame them, the only thing you're going to do is provoke the defense. Because they haven't, they haven't been submitted to you. They're not cooperating with you. They haven't put themselves in a position uh, to be made answerable to you. And let me say this, uh, just a connection to somebody or a relationship to somebody alone does not hold us accountable. You can say, well, Brother Aaron's the pastor, so he's accountable to the sheep. You know, I, I, I ought to be, right? And as the Bible teaches and the message teaches it, and the sheep accountable to the pastor, it's so beautiful that when you recognize mutual dependency is what avoids codependency, and it's under the guise of codependency that sheep are abused, right. pastors are abused, because once it becomes a codependency, that's when there's manipulation, abuse, and control, and, there, and, and people are not they didn't answer for their conduct. And so the relationship alone does not hold us accountable. We must, within the context of the connection and relationship, voluntarily submit to it. Amen. So one of the things that I've learned in studying the subject is that accountability should never be imposed by power. So if someone ought to answer, you could recognize they need to, but you can never impose accountability by power. Accountability must be offered willingly and voluntarily. So accountability is never imposed, it's offered. Something that's yielded, it's welcomed through humility. And so if we try to blame someone who hasn't welcomed the blame or hasn't welcomed the correction, hasn't welcomed the, the answer, the accountability, then we put them in that position where we're just trying to fix blame and once we do it, we just cause them to instinctively be defensive. But remember that about accountability. If you want to be accountable, then you have to voluntarily and through humility offer it. And I know we might have situations as adults where we want to hold people accountable and you may feel that you have the right because you're in relationship to them. But what you, what, what you would desire is that that person would offer it. it. It wouldn't work if all of a sudden I just picked up the phone and started calling people in the church and said, well, I'm just going to hold you accountable on your desire detox. And it would go ring, ring, and you'd pick it up and you'd be, hello? And you'd say, excuse me? It doesn't work that way, does it? has to be voluntarily offered. I'm not interested in auditing that anyways. Now, the third problem with the blame game, I should have said second just to kind of get you guys. The third problem with the blame game it's an, is it, it's an act of self-justification. And if I could put it this way, and I think, I think these things are real heavy principles tonight, real, real solid. Uh, this is good, good eating. Kids eat free and all there is is steak on the menu tonight. 
even though it's very simple, I think it's, there's some heft to it. There's some real good cal- The caloric density is off the charts tonight. Uh, when I say the act of self-justification, I hope that means enough to you that as we kind of amplify it a little bit for a few moments, when we blame someone, we're often, uh, well, what, often when blame, we're blaming others, it's more of an act of excusing ourselves. Uh, it's not so much that we're accurately assessing blame on the appropriate person, but when we blame others, it's maybe more so that we're trying to excuse ourselves or we're making excuses for our mistakes. Adam did it. Adam could have said, you know what? I shouldn't have done it. But I knew, Lord, that if, if I didn't take her to myself and show some responsibility, she would have died. Adam more or less used by pointing the finger. He, finger, he was making an excuse as to why he did it. And so if we're going to have willful personal accountability, if we're going to voluntarily through humility take responsibility for our actions, then, uh, then we've, got to, we've got to demonstrate that example first. If I could put it, willful accountability is taking responsibility. And it's, and, and, and it's, it's showing ourselves as being, I, I'm, going to, I'm willing to take accountability, I'm willing to be held accountable, and it affords a great example. Instead of just offering excuses, the Bible says in Galatians 6, 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. Remember how we looked through this in verse 2, how bear ye one another's burden, but now in chapter verse 5, it's this burden which is a load or obligation, one's own personal obligation. It speaks of a ship that's laden down with goods, but these goods are marked for that ship, and that ship is made to transport that. So it's not the kind of burden you say, oh no, they're loading the ship. Let me take some of this and put it on my ship. It's like, no, every man has to bear his own obligation. In other words, we have to answer for ourselves. We, 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 we must answer for our load, for our responsibility, for our obligation, and not load it up on somebody else. Because that's what verse 2 is saying. Uh, bear you one another's burdens. And, in other words, the number one rule of that would be carry your own and don't put on them your own. Don't put on them somebody else's. So we must answer for ourselves and not this, put this heaviness or this inappropriate weight on somebody else according to verse 2. And so blame, the blame game, one of the problems with the blame game is it is evident that when someone blames somebody else, they're usually not necessarily wanting to actually hold somebody truly and purely accountable, but there's an element of excusing themselves with it. And so throughout this, I'm, I'm hoping maybe just to kind of look at the other side instead of just focusing maybe at one time on the, uh, the positive side of not playing the blame game. But if we're going to have willful humility or willful accountability through humility, when others see our willingness to be accountable, so if we're saying tonight, game over, I'm not going to play the game, uh, blame game anymore. If people see us being willing to be accountable, it motivates them to be accountable. And we can inspire, inspire others in our relationships or others in our family to be accountable by accepting responsibility ourselves before placing the blame. Because we're only, we're only affording them an example. That, and, and I wonder where he, uh, the woman got the nerve to blame the serpent. She's sitting there going, we're busted, we're busted, we, we're, we're, we're dead in the water, there's no way we're getting out of this. And, and, and Adam says, I didn't do it. The woman you gave me, she did it. And she's like, I didn't think about that. I didn't, knew, I didn't know you could do that. And maybe she's kind of smarting a little bit because she got blamed, but she's like, I don't like the fact that you threw me under the bus, but I didn't know you could throw somebody under the bus, so the serpent did it, right? And so she learned, she learned from Adam that, oh, you can, you can blame it on somebody else. And so if we said game over and we were willing to accept responsibility, accept the blame, it affords somebody else the example of accepting the blame and it motivates others to be accountable. When others see that you hold yourself accountable, it motivates them to be accountable. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, this is a real critical scripture. This could have been my text. And I think just reading through it just kind of adds to this. It adds some more weight and some more meat to the, to the skeleton of this. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, let's just work through this. Judge not that ye be not judged. And so it's really uh, talk, It's really challenging us on our instinct to condemn somebody else. You know, kind of draft a sentence. It says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So kind of however you want to judge somebody else, you're going to get judged by. It says, and why? Now this is when it, it I mean, it escalates 
even further. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? And we're all kind of thinking, yeah, I've noticed that little speck of straw there. I've noticed that little sliver. But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Jesus using this extravagant, dramatic language to make a point. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? And isn't that just like human nature? To see something wrong in somebody else and perceive it as something that needs to be dealt with when we're not willing to deal with an even greater problem in ourselves and perhaps not even considering that the beam in my own eye is impairing my ability to appreciate the severity of the sliver in my brother's eye. Because Jesus says, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. When he says judge not, it's an act of offering an opinion concerning right or wrong. You're making some sort of assessment, whether someone's in the right or someone's in the wrong. It's calling someone into question. It is a, it is a part, you could say, of a blame game. You see the fault in someone else. You want them to answer for the fault. You say, well, you need to address this. You need to deal with this. You've got this moat in your eye. You've got this moat in your eye. And Jesus is saying, you know what? You can see the fault in somebody else, but you can't see your own. I think we've mentioned this here before. You've heard of the phrase, the pot calling the kettle black. And it, and it wasn't that they're both black. It's the pot seeing its reflection in the kettle. Because the kettle is, is, is reflecting the image of the pot. And so that when someone says, well, that's just the pot calling the kettle black. Well, it's not saying that the kettle's just the same fault as the pot. It's saying the pot has no idea that the air that it sees and the blackness it sees in the kettle is actually not in the kettle. It's in itself. And aren't we, all, aren't we kind of instinctively able to see the bad in somebody else or project the bad in somebody else as actually our own bad? Like, oh, that girl is such a gossip. Let me tell you what she does. Right? And it's like the, the, the girl may never say a thing. But you've projected your own gossip onto her through your own weakness and complexes. And, and this could be in, in all sorts of ways. It just doesn't have to be, you know, a guy talking about a girl, girl talk, a girl talking about a girl. The pot calling the kettle black, it's beholding its own blackness in the kettle. And that's why Jesus calls it hypocrisy. Can't remember who said it, but it's, a, it's true enough. Well, I guess who said it might cause you pause, but I don't know who said it. But so there's probably no such thing as a conscious hypocrite. I've heard some people get close. But there's probably no such thing as a conscious hypocrite. They're convinced. Now, they've got a problem. They've got a problem. Well, shouldn't you address yours first? No, they've got a problem. And this is at that heart. This is at the core of the blame game. That we're very quickly ready to see something, a perceived weakness in somebody else that we're not willing to consider in ourselves. So notice how remarkable the scripture is in Psalms 19, verses 12 to 13. Who can understand his errors? What a question. Who can understand his mistakes? Who can understand his faults? Who can see them? The Bible says every man is right in his own eyes and the ways of men are clean in his own eyes. And there's this, this kind of this really robust uh, means of self-justifying and well, you know, if I did it, I mean, isn't it kind of like, well, the steps of the right, good man are ordered of the Lord and, you know, this is predestinated and, you know, and things happen and they're just always willing to justify it. I mean, could you just imagine, you know, Eichmann's over there going, well, look what it accomplished, guys. Right? Prophecy's fulfilled. And that's the way some people act is they look at the results and they see the outcome and they see that God made it work out and they're willing to justify. Well, that's why God did this and that's why God did this because they're always quick to justify themselves. So when this question is, who can understand his errors? Who's willing to own them? Who can recognize them? Who can own them? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Purge me of the unrecognized mistakes that I'm so quick to blame others for or for which I am, I, that I unconsciously excuse. Cleanse me from secret faults. The unrecognized thing unrecognized things that I'm actually to blame for. That maybe I blame on other people or I, I just instinctively excuse or that I'm just merely unconscious of. What honesty, what introspection. As the question is asked, who can understand his errors? And then the psalmist immediately says, Lord, cleanse me then. And then he says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. 
It speaks of how I will be innocent of the great transgression and they'll not have dominion over me. But a presumptuous sin is a sin against the checks of conscience. Hold me back from the sins that are against knowledge. Now, I just want to open the door and just point into the room where cognitive dissonance lives. And I know enough tonight to not go there because from that moment on, you all would exercise it to the very end. But this, this, this part of our brains, like we don't, cognitive dissonance speaks of how we don't like it when we get uncomfortable. And we don't like it when we, have, when we think something is true and we're confronted with evidence that we might begin to recognize that controverts what we're, the, the opinion we already hold. And that's called dissonance. And so what we do is we just reject anything that makes us feel uncomfortable. And so this is, I believe, what presumptuous sins is kind of touching on, is how there's this check against your conscience. And it, it, if I could put it this way, knowledge without action only increases our sense of guilt. When you know something and don't act accordingly, or when you know something and act against it, it only increases our guilt. So the presumptuous sins, these are the things where I'm acting against knowledge. Now, David, the psalmist has said, you know, Lord, who can know his heirs? Purge me of my secret faults for these things that I'm not aware of that I do, that maybe I unconsciously blame on somebody else or I'm unconsciously excusing the things that I've been able to justify without even a thought. But Lord, even those ones that I know I shouldn't do, but I just find myself saying, it doesn't matter, and coming up with excuses for it. And because this knowledge without action or acting against knowledge increases our guilt, because cognitive dissonance is such an uncomfortable feeling, we're quick to shift the blame and excuse our conduct. I'm going to read a statement from a book that I read years ago. As fallible human beings, all of us share the impulse to justify ourselves and avoid taking responsibility for any actions that turned out to be harmful, immoral, or stupid. I don't know why I said stupid so aggressively. I think it's the, the drywall dust. My lisp is in 100% full active mode, too. They, if you could think about that, how we all share the impulse to justify ourselves and avoid taking responsibility when something is harmful, immoral, or just wrong, or strong-headed or wrong. And, and, and the statement that's made in this book is, how do you get a moral man to lose his moral compass? And I'm kind of rephrasing it. It says, just let him make one mistake and self-justification will do the rest. Isn't that shocking? That if you want to see someone lose their integrity, lose their testimony, find themselves falling in, in scandal, all it takes for a good man to lose his way is one mistake in self-justification. And he says, most of us will never be in the position to make decisions affecting lives and deaths of millions of people. But whether the consequences of our mistakes are trivial or tragic, listen to this. On a small scale or a national canvas, most of us find it difficult, if not impossible. This is why presidents can't own it. But this is also why children... Stay far away from accepting it. It's impossible. Difficult, if not impossible, to say, I was wrong. I made a terrible mistake. The higher the stakes, emotional. So the higher the stakes would be emotional, financial, moral, the greater the difficulty. The higher the stakes. In other words, when accountability is the most necessary... When someone needs to answer, we need to figure this out. We, 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 we've got an issue here. Someone is to blame. Something's amiss. The higher the stakes, the harder it is to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I made a terrible mistake. It says it goes further than that. Most people, when directly confronted by evidence that they're wrong, do not change their point of view or course of action, but justify even more tenaciously. Just think of the... Tens of millions of people today, when they found out that Fox settled the defamation suit that Dominion filed against them and admitted to the tune of almost a billion dollars that they lied about the election lies, think of how many people begin to engage in cognitive dissonance saying, now I know the truth. <laughs> They'll justify it even more tenaciously. Even irrefutable evidence is rarely enough to pierce, catch this phrase because I'm coming back to it, the mental armor of self-justification. This is why we act in the blame game. The Bible told us in Matthew chapter 7, the instinct of human nature. 
It offers us some sort of solution with this attitude of who can understand his errors. We can't understand our errors. Our prayer ought to be, Lord, cleanse me from all these secret faults where I, 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 I am to blame, but I don't know it. I am to blame, but I excuse it. And Lord, even worse, cleanse me, purge me, keep me from these presumptuous sins when I act against my knowledge because all I'm going to do is start justifying why I did. And it creates a mental armor. If I could continue in this, it's human nature. And I think what this is drawing on, it's human nature to take credit for success. Right? That's why when you read something about your, the meaning of your name or how they say, now it's just not what your name means. It's, does it have hard D's in it? Or does it have a K sound? Or does it have a H sound? And it all has meaning, right? So when we read it, I'm like, oh, oh, I don't agree with that. But you know, like you read a little bit further, you're like, but I agree with that. It's the same person. It's the same theology. It's the same idea. We're just, it's human nature to take credit for success. In other words, attribute the success of something to our efforts. But just as strongly, we explain away our failures. Self-justification takes credit for the good actions, but makes excuses for the bad actions. And so this is the fourth, I mean the second problem with the blame game. Usually when we blame someone, we blame the person who's not there. And so we often implicate the innocent or the voiceless, the ones who don't have a voice, the ones that don't have a say, the one that can't say anything. When we excuse ourselves, and let me say this with, with absolutely, if you are 100% to blame and you blame somebody else, the innocent are blamed. If you shift the blame to somebody who maybe is part to the blame, but you're fully to blame, and maybe we do it to someone who's not there, right? Whenever we're in school and we have a group assignment, it's the person who didn't show up who tanked the group. Like, well, I sure wish Teddy was here because he blew it, right? And you're, you're quick to blame someone who's not there. The Dutch have a proverb, the absent always bear the blame because it's just human nature. And so when we are in a position where we ought to be accountable for our actions and we shift the blame and we deflect it, oftentimes we're doing it to the weaker, which Adam could have definitely be characterized as saying, hey, he pointed his finger at his wife. But is she not the one that was deceived? Is she not the one that should have had his empathy? Is, he, is she not the one that he could have said, you know what? This woman that you gave me, I had the responsibility over her. I made a terrible mistake. I'm sorry. But through our shifting the blame and the blame game, it's often the absent, the voiceless, or the weak or the innocent that get the blame. But let me say this, I should say this about Christians. That as Christians, and as a people of integrity, we ought to take more share of the blame and much less share of the credit. That if, if something is done well, and there's credit to be given for it, as a Christian, let somebody else share the credit. Let somebody else have the credit. And if something's wrong, we ought to, as Christians, take more share of the blame than we are willing to take share of the credit. And let me just say that this, this is the kind of mark that fathers could have in their home. This is the kind of mark that we could have for the brothers here. There's so many uh, brothers here that excel in leadership and have very uh, weighty, important positions within their, their industries. Let me say, if you don't already put this in practice, a great leader shares more of the blame and much less of the credit. Brother Branham in the sermon, My New Ministry, he says, you don't have to be rich and mighty in this world. I was going to use this at the very end. I just felt compelled to put it right here in what should have been the end based upon time. But he says, so you don't have to be rich and mighty in this world to be great in the sight of God. You only have to be humble in your heart. God calls that greatness. Remember, he says a great man is somebody who makes you feel great. He says, he that's great, he that's great enough to humble himself. That's a great person that'll take the blame for everything. What would we call that person? Let's just be honest. Let's just say that a group of us got together and we vandalized the fellowship hall. And after we were done, you know, everybody gets called on the carpet and we're like, hey, who vandalized the fellowship, Paul? And a few of us brothers over there going, and, and Chase, Brother Chase, not even there. He goes, I'll take responsibility for it. I mean, that's maybe not advisable as your lawyer, but <laughs> I mean, it almost doesn't even seem to be logical. But I believe he's speaking within reason, a great person who has responsibility. He'll take the blame. That'll humble himself. He says, that's greatness. Is somebody who's not afraid to shoulder the blame. 
Somebody who's not afraid to say, you know what? I'll take responsibility for it. That's my fault. No, I'll, I'll own it. It's okay. Let's not get bogged down in proportional liability. Let's not get, try to figure out who's responsible for it. Let's just figure out what was wrong, what happened. You know what? I'll take ownership of that. Let me take it from here. Let's go forward. Let's fix this. I remember one time at the very beginning of the church, something came up and I mentioned something to Brother Mike. And it was just something we had to address. And his response was adapt and overcome. And, you know, he, 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 he didn't have time to try to figure out who's wrong, how we should handle it, or, you know, how it could have been handled. It was, we see the need, let's just adapt and let's overcome in the moment that we're in. I think maybe too often we're, you know, we want to hot wash and download instead of just addressing a problem and going forward. I know it may be politically incorrect to quote Dilbert, but I believe this is from, it was either from, I'm not, I don't know if it's from Mr. Adams. You saw what I did there. But it says, the job isn't done until you've blamed someone for the parts that went wrong. That's where we live. Job's not complete until you found someone to blame for the parts that aren't perfect. For all the hiccups, for the delay. We got it done, but we didn't get it on time. And it's Teddy's fault we didn't get it on time. And so the third problem with the blame game is it keeps us in bondage to weakness. I think this may be just one of the most important parts. And I, and, and I think we're still doing good on time if I could finish in seven minutes. But the problem with the blame game is it keeps us in bondage to, to self-defeat. We're defeating ourselves when we choose to play the ga blame game. When we put a quarter in the arcade to play the, game, the blame game, it's, we're admit, we're, we're, it's a, it's a self-defeating move. And it keeps us in bondage to weakness. This is something I found as I studied the subject. The blame game is often played by those who have a victim mentality. And I believe that some could be characterized as this, but we can momentarily in certain instances, though it may not be our character, there's times when we feel so overwhelmed or we feel so attacked, we feel that something's so wrong that we kind of take on the persona and the feelings, and we consider ourselves the victim. I'm the aggrieved. I'm the victim. I'm the one that's harmed. And for someone to carry a victim mentality, be characterized as that, it's somebody whose thought process and their thinking is characterized by blaming everyone and everything else for what's happening to you. In other words, these unfortunate events that have happened, I'm the victim. And it's kind of a way of saying, I didn't cause this. They're just out to get me. I didn't do this. This is a conspiracy. I'm not responsible. This is just how my life works. And I know that I could spend a lot more time on this mindset of the victim mentality and how that when we blame others, we're, we're, we're yielding. Where's that? When we blame somebody, we're saying, that person had the power, that person had the control, I didn't. I'd love to spend more time on this, but I want you to catch that. When we blame somebody else and we're willing to let them be fully answerable for it, we're saying, it was outside of my power. Do you know what, notice what you've just done? You've just forfeited your liberty. You've just forfeited your power. You forfeited whatever right you had to not participate. Say, so no, I'm in, I am subject to that whim. I'm subject to that person. Whatever their actions are, I'm drawn, just got like a tractor beam. I'm just drawn into it and I had to do it. And let me just say, this problem with the blame game, it keeps us in that bondage of mental weakness. It keeps us in that self-defeating cycle. Uh, we're blaming everyone and everyone else, but when we blame, we're basically taking more power and giving it to somebody else. More power and giving it to somebody else. Let me say this, you cannot overcome. You cannot address the problems in your life if you insist on being the victim and always blame somebody else. Leo Tolstoy, I know I'm probably not saying that right since it's Russian, but he said a bad mood is often the reason for blaming others. But very often, can you catch this? His brother Leo has to say this. Very often blaming others causes bad feelings in us. And the more we blame others, the worse we feel. Think about what's going on inside of our spirits and how strong these mechanisms are in our hearts. Talk about a segment of character disorder that when you think about how someone has done something and we have this victim mentality maybe we're in a bad mood so we blame somebody else but he's saying very often it's blaming others that causes the bad feeling so something's happened and when you as soon as you attribute blame i hope you can catch this as soon as you attribute the blame that your sense of offense grows greater right. and you think it's because 
You've measured what they've done appropriately. Like, I can't believe they did that to me. <gasps> Ow! That is disgusting. I can't believe they did that. You should be ashamed. Oh, my. You are fully. Oh, my goodness. The worse we feel and we don't realize it, we're doing it to ourselves. We've only begun to feel worse and worse and worse because we're putting the blame on somebody else and our conscience is saying, you know better. You know better. But what we're doing is we're trying to pass that ugliness on to somebody else. And we don't even realize that the reason why we feel bad is not because of the initial offense, but because of all of our efforts to place the blame on somebody else and not accept responsibility ourselves. It's self-defeating because we're overtly relinquishing power and self-control to somebody else. Or maybe not self-control, just control to others. And by blaming others to some degree, and I'm careful how I say it, by some degree we're admitting on some level we're powerless. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. He that makes excuses for it. He that justifies them himself shall not prosper, shall not advance, shall not make prog progress, shall not be profitable. In other words, if you cover a sin, it corrupts you. If you cover sin, it weakens you. You can't advance. You can't grow. It, it has a defiling, corrupting nature to it. He that covereth his sins, whoever is in the mode of blaming, excusing, self justify he's not going to advance. And now notice the Bible says, but whoso, of, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I draw from this scripture the claim that blame is one of the most destructive forces in relationships and one of the most destructive forces in our families. Whether you want to talk about home or work or any kind of relationship or church, blame is one of the most destructive, corrupting, defiling forces there are. You know, it could be said that some marriages crumble because of acts of infidelity. Some marriages crumble in moments or instances of violence. And, there's, and it's obvious. And there's things that are done and we can attribute the crumbling of that marriage to uh, uh, some distinct uh, unfaithfulness or some harm or some damage that's done. But you know that most marriages slowly dissolve. And an escalating, of pattern, escalating pattern of blame and self-justification. This is, this is where, and you say, oh my, you know, why, why are you talking about the neighbors in the apartment next door? It was super relevant to this point. I think it's important for all of us to think about what corrupts our relationships. And how marriages of people that we love and even people who claim to believe the message and people who, who claim to love each other, how do they get to the place where they have contempt? How do they get to the place where they're no longer willing to work together? You can see that it's often just this snowballing of blame. Because they've been able to at some point put the blame on this person. And maybe they act defensively and maybe they're not owning it and maybe it's their fault. But if you've been able to somehow attribute 100% of the blame to somebody else or use the fact that they have some blame and they're not willing to own it, to not own your own, then it creates this pattern of self-justification for the ones you know and for the ones you're willing to be blamed for and blame for everything else. And without noticing it, I think this happens in so many relationships. You're free to amen to the extent that you agree and don't feel like you're getting called out on it. But when we start with that blame game and even in the context of relationships, we don't even notice it, but we become entrenched. This is how people get polarized. Through cognitive dissonance, through blame, through self-justification. We get entrenched in polarized positions. And one feels this way and the other one feels that way and they're both saying, but it's his fault. And they're saying, no, but it's her fault. And they're stuck in it. What got them there? The blame game. And that's why it's called mental armor. Because the Bible said, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That mental armor, blame hardens our hearts. That's what it does. Every time you blame, it's an injury. Every time you blame, you get harder. Your conscience gets harder. Your conscience gets harder. But listen, when the Bible says confession... It, it softens it. When we take responsibility for our own actions, we feel better. I challenge you to try it. Maybe try it in maybe the most innocence of context that the next time your child does something where you're absolutely convinced they're 100% to blame, say, I'm sorry, it's my fault, let's fix it. And you'll find yourself in a position where you'll probably feel a lot better. Because blame only hardens our hearts, whereas confession softens it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. 
The Bible says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I encourage you to go back and read this scripture. Spend some time pondering it. But it's saying, be gentle, be even-tempered, be self-controlled. And if any man have a quarrel, and all right, you're trying to get technical. Brother, it said man. Brother Aaron, it's talking about the men. It's talking about us, believers. If any man have a quarrel against any, the word is blame. If anybody blames somebody else, if anybody has a complaint against someone else, if anyone finds fault in somebody else, forgive them. This is what the Bible's telling us to do. It's not saying that if you blame someone, file a complaint. If you blame someone, you know, you need to place the blame. It's actually saying, you know what? Let it go. Forgive them. Don't get caught up in the blame game. Because the fourth problem with the blame game, nobody wins. There's never a winner in the blame game. And it always comes with the price. The Bible saying we have to forbear one another, forgive one another. We have to be gentle. We ought to be even tempered. And if any man blames somebody else, if anyone have a complaint with somebody else, what you ought to do if you have this instinct to blame, if you recognize the blame, recognize it in, pay, in placing blame, it comes with the price. And you may think it's just a quarter in the arcade. You may think, oh, this game is free. This is free where I can play it as much as I want. No, it always costs to play the blame game. And the cost is high. Because even when blame is justified, even when you feel that person is to blame and you absolutely know it, I know those brothers are the ones that uh, vandalized the fellowship hall. I know they're the ones that did it. They need to answer for it. It carries negative consequences. And if I could put it this way, just so you could understand, the blame game, there are no winners. There are no resolutions. The game can, the, the only way that you can end the game is to quit it. It's a game over. I won't play the blame game anymore because it just escalates. It spirals. It goes out of control. And if I could say this about the blame game, the reason why I say it comes with the price and it carries negative consequences, it is the exact opposite of problem solving. We expend so much energy trying to figure out who's at fault. We, have, we put so much effort in trying to place the blame. Whereas instead we ought to, as Jesus says, forgive and look for a solution. Forgive it. If there's pieces that need to be picked up, let's pick them up. Forgive it. If there's something broken, let's fix it. Let's not shame somebody and shake somebody and begrudge somebody. And, and you look at the other scriptures that are being used in this context. It's encouraging us. Let's, listen, when something's been done and it's wrong, the opposite to problem solving is trying to place the blame and figure out who's liable and who's at fault. The best thing to do is to forgive and fix. The Bible says forgiving one another. In other words, some of the translations say be quick to forgive. Why? Because Christ forgave us also. When we were guilty, right? When he could have put the blame entirely upon us because he was guilty, what did he do? We're the guilty ones. And he said, I'll take it. He shouldered our blame. He accepted responsibility for our faults and he forgave us. Even there when he's dying on the cross, he doesn't say, you crucified me. You put me up here. He said, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they do. So if I could say this, even when the fault is clear, even when the blame can really be placed upon somebody, we ought to have a deeper empathy for the offender. We ought to be more moved to forgiveness. Yes, blame is available. The blame card is on the table. The blame game is always available for you to step up to it. But you know what you could do instead of blame? If any one of you have a blame against somebody else, he's saying, be quick to forgive. Don't enter into the blame game. So when we have an opportunity to blame, we can be empathetic. I know this is a lengthy quote, but I feel we're doing awesome on time. I mean, let me just say this in terms of being empathetic towards those that make mistakes. In Galatians 6.1, I think we even have the scripture there. It says, ye who are spiritual, when you find one taken in a fault, when you find someone is to blame, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of weakness, considering your own selves. What does that speak of? Em empathy. When someone makes a mistake, are you above them? Have you never made one? I mean, it was a question I asked one, somebody one time. I said, have you ever made a mistake when doing this? And, 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 and I kind of impeached them a little bit. I kind of boxed them in. And when I asked if they'd ever made a mistake, they wanted to say they never made a mistake. So you know what they said? This is where I kind of paused on a conscious hypocrite. They said, yes, 
Because if I say no, it'll come across as arrogant. So they admitted to making mistakes just because they, if they it, it said that they hadn't because they thought they hadn't, they know they would sound horrible. And that's where it's like, where's the empathy? When someone is in that place where they never do anything wrong, they've never made a mistake, then how do you think they view everybody else who does? And so where do we get as people, when we look at a young person who's making a mistake, we look at an individual that falls, and we immediately just judge him and castigate him and say all sorts of nasty things about him. What about yourself? Who would we be without the grace of God? We should throw our, we should acknowledge, as the Bible says, who confesseth and forsaketh shall be shown mercy. Why don't we just say, I am what I am by the grace of God. And but for the grace of God, there goeth I, and that I've somehow found myself in his bed of mercy. And they're renewed every morning, and he's kept me, and he's provided for me. And if it, listen, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all, we would all be wrecked. So we ought to have that instinct to be empathetic as opposed to blaming, forgive. Considering ourselves, putting ourselves in their shoes and saying, you know what, if it was me, I'd want to be forgiven. If it was me, I'd want to be understood. Surely that person didn't mean to do that. Surely they weren't this way. I could even go so far as saying this is a lot of times people do things because they're just, they're just clueless. Not because they're mean, they're just clueless. Or maybe that's a harsh word to use. They're just insensitive. They're not overtly mean. They're not doing it because, yeah, I really don't like that guy. I'm going to do this. They just don't realize what they're doing is mean. Anyone in that case, they're, they're having a lot of grace and being able to establish boundaries and ways to address that would be what that person needs instead of mistreating and bullying thing and, and talking bad about them. And, but being empathetic, they don't realize it. we got to help them realize it some way. But you know, even the person who is intentionally mean, something's, done, something's happened to them, and that's why they are the way they are. And without empathy, even if you can't be empathetic, at least without sympathy, saying something happened to them. We just perpetuate the problem. Brother Branham said in the sermon, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's making a comment about how he'd come back from traveling. When he came back, there was a little issue in the church. He says, when we come in, we found the church kind of in a little upset here and there. This is kind of a neat story, isn't it? And some of the members had begun to kind of get a little lukewarm, pull away, holding little enmities against each other and so forth like that. And I went around from one to the other, till we got us all straightened up. He said, now it's all right, and there's nothing wrong. And there was nothing wrong with any of the members. They're everyone fine men and women. But what happened? Something got in there. Something mixed things up, got a little lukewarm, had little entities or whatever. So if they could just realize, this is the part, I know it maybe seems just a little bit, seem maybe a little bit off subject, or maybe just in a little bit different vein. But I want to take this from this. If any man have blame, forgive. He says, if they could just realize that that's the devil that gets between the people. That's exactly right. It's not the people. If you can let a brother see that, then he won't hold enmity against the other fellow. He'll feel bad. He'll feel like, well, I feel sorry for my brother. See, he did do wrong. Why? It wasn't the brother. It was the devil that did that. So the brother did wrong. He's like Adam. He's in the transgression. He's like the woman. She's in the transgression. He's like Cain. He's in the transgression. There's, there's portional blame. There's someone to be at fault. But he says, you know, it's the devil that did that. You say, well, this guy did a certain, certain thing. Your brother didn't do that. Your sister didn't do that. That was the devil that got into them and that did that. So don't blame the brother, the sister. Blame the devil. That's the one who caused it. I shared this, I wrestled with whether or not I ought to share it just because I feel like it kind of takes a little bit different light on the whole subject. But I want you to just recognize that we do have something else we can do. When the blame game is offered to us, we can forgive. And then if we feel really, really pressed to be able to put the blame on somebody, why don't we just drill down a little bit deeper and say, it's the devil that does it. And put the blame on the devil. And we say, well, yeah, I mean, maybe... I mean, the serpent was responsible, and Adam was responsible, and the woman was responsible, and we can recognize all the responsibility, but just place the blame squarely on who we can blame so that we can have some empathy. And if not empathy, some sympathy for those who make mistakes and are at fault. Ah, the blame game. I hope we can say game over to it. The Bible says, who can understand his heirs? And then ask, cleanse me, cleanse me from my secret faults. That's the attitude I want you to have. I, if we could, with the slide there, just in, in, in your view, 
Who can understand his heirs? Cleanse thou me from my self-justification. Cleanse me from my cognitive dissonance. Keep it far from me. Cleanse me from this always blaming others. Doesn't make you a bad person. It's helping you understand what you do have responsibility over. There's people that are gonna have, they, they are to blame. They did make the mistakes. They did do things to you. They are responsible. But Lord, what am I responsible for? What are, our, are, are my heirs? I believe this is the attitude that we ought to have. What is my share? What could have I done better? This happens a lot in, in, in counseling. That generally people come to you with a problem they have with somebody else. And, and what they're wanting to hear from you is all your opinions on, on how bad that person is in what we can do together to fix them. And I've had this happen in all the, the, all the years I've counseled. For whatever reason, God always put it in my mind that when someone comes to me with the problem and the problem's with somebody else, I, I'm not counseling somebody else. I'm counseling the person that came to me. And my instinct has always been, well, what can we do to help you to overcome this? And you'd be surprised how many times it's like, me? I've got to do something about this? You mean you're not, you're not going to go talk to them? Wait, what do, you, what, do you, what do you mean? The person doesn't even go to our church. They're not even a believer. You want me to call them and say, I don't know if you heard, but I'm a message pastor. <laughs> and you are wrong. I'm so sorry. And you start to counsel the person. You say, well, you know what? You need to show a lot of grace. You need to show a lot of patience. Have you said or done anything that provoked this? Did you do something to put yourself in a position where they didn't trust you? Well, how dare you? <laughs> to actually try to find some secret fault in me. We should be asking ourselves, what is my fault? That should be a way that we should approach problems together. Is I've got this problem. What can I do better? I have a problem with somebody else. What have I done wrong? There's a preacher, I can't remember just exactly what area he's from, Henry Ward Beecher. I don't know why we do all three of those, but it's just Henry Ward Beecher. Every time I see him referred to, he'd get his middle name Ward in there. But he was asked one time by a young preacher, you know, how can I keep my congregation from falling asleep? And I didn't find, find that because I was searching for solutions. <laughs> it says young preacher, I'm 48 years old. How, how can I keep... The congregation wide awake and attentive while I'm preaching. And so Henry Ward Beecher replied that he always had a man who watched for sleepers. So like a deacon. And he kind of looked out in the church, right? And he'd walk around and he'd try to find somebody who was sleeping. And if he ever found somebody, I got a lot of grace for kids on, for kids, for children that eat free on Wednesday nights. But he goes around and he said he'd find somebody that was sleeping. And he'd given him instructions. As soon as he saw anyone that started to nod, started to doze, or started to fall asleep, he had one instruction. To run to the pulpit and wake up the preacher. <laughs> and that was the instructions. And what was Henry Ward Beecher's self-awareness? Or what was his, his conviction? I'll take responsibility for the ones that are sleeping. Don't rouse them up. They probably have their reasons much better than my own. And they, they may have gone through this and they may have that problem. Wake me up because perhaps I'm the one that put them to sleep. And what I loved about that, that's a, you can put that slide back up there, Brother John, game over. I love it, game over. Young preacher comes to Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, how could we keep the congregation from falling asleep when I'm preaching? That's a good question. Let's figure this out and let's find out all the things that make them sleep and let's find out what they're doing the night before and, you know, whether, what energy drink are they uh, using because some work better than others and let's do vitamin B pills. And it just, it, nothing was about saying, you know what, young preacher, don't put them to sleep. That was game over to the blame game. It didn't even start. And I say, let's quit it. Anybody here playing it? You know, you know, in the Nintendo days, when a game wasn't going the way you liked it, you hit the reset button, right? You just, you just hit the reset button. That was it. You could start all over. I don't know how the gaming systems work these days. Who knows? It's probably one of these things where you can't get rid of it. But it's there again. But I, I just suggest turning off the game console, turning it off, just get rid of it. Let the devil have it back. 
It's just not worth playing. You've been trying to win it, trying to win it, trying to win it, and you've never won yet. You thought you did, but you only felt worse. Because no one wins the blame game. And I say, let's just quit it. Stop playing it. If we've started, stop. And do as the Bible says in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This must be our zeal. I remember the, uh, the, the phrase, uh, my wife was sharing it with me 20-something years ago. I just remember, I think it might have been when Brother John had preached something. Her, 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 her dad on how it expresses the zeal of the age. That if God's asking them to do something, I remember at the time, maybe in my theological mind, I'm thinking, eh, I don't know. Maybe the zeal of the age is the son of man. What do you think, right? Like you just, you get in your mind loftier ideals. But this is, the, this is what he asked him to be zealous for, to repent. And this must still be our zeal. That we're taught to be quick to repent just as quick as we are to forgive. To be willing to ask ourselves, even in the face of when we've been harmed and when we've been hurt, and maybe when our blame on somebody else is justified, to just simply ask ourselves, what could have I done to do better? And you might actually find yourself, instead of blaming someone, you might actually find yourself apologizing to someone and say, you know what, I want to apologize. I put you in a tough spot. I want to apologize. I should have done this. I should have done that. And in, with the apology, the person's like, oh, no, 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 no. No, that was my fault. Just think about how practical this is. That you're willing to own it. You're willing to accept it. You've got down on your knees before God in prayer. You've confessed and forsaken. You've softened your heart. And you haven't hid yourself behind the mental armor of self-sanctification. And now you begin to feel and you begin to get over those barriers enough to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And the other person's like, Oh, I accept your apology, but really it was my fault. What you don't know is I did this and put you in that situation. And at that point, if you really weren't playing the blame game, you don't go, I knew it. <laughs> you just say, hey, it's okay. Let's go forward. Let's go forward. Game over. Amen. Let's end the blame game. I trust it's spoken to your heart in a very relevant and deep way. Again, I encourage you to listen to this again. I don't think I've ever told a church to do it. But I encourage you to listen to it again if you can stomach it. And if someone in your family hasn't heard it, find a nice way. Right? Say, I learned a lot. I'm sorry. I've made mistakes. And if you want to know why my heart's changed, listen to this service. Right? Instead of saying, I heard something tonight and you need to listen to it. Like of all services you miss, you miss the one on the blame game, right? No, let's not do that. But I think it's important for us as a church. I want this to be a part of our character as a church. I want this to be part of the way that we handle differences with one another. I want this to be a part of how we handle our relationships. Because as a church, we're growing. And we're not just growing because we're knocking out walls. We're tearing down barriers. We're tearing down barriers and we're growing closer together. And as we do, we need to understand one another and we need to be able to not engage in these, these instinctive things that are harmful to ourselves and hurtful to other people. And I want us as a church to have it in our hearts that the blame game is not an option, but solving problems is. And we will work through things and we'll make things right and we'll figure out a way to achieve success instead of trying to figure out a way to shame somebody and blame somebody. Will you, will you agree with me that game over? It's the end of the blame game as a church? That we will, and, and I'll, I'll promise this to you as a pastor, I'll take responsibility. I'll hold myself accountable to you. I willingly and voluntarily offer it to you. I'm willing to be accountable, and let's not have a blame game in this assembly. And if we could do it as a church, maybe it'll be a good example for you and your families. And I know it'll make a difference in your life. I love you. Thank you so much for your attentiveness tonight, your patience. It's been worth it. Could we stand together?